Wow. Um, so I'll tell you, uh, I've had the flu the last few days and not feeling 100% today until right this minute. <laughs> and after that, okay. Yeah. That was amazing. Let's pray. Holy One, we thank you for the gift of Tara's voice and her witness today with that voice. We thank you that we're all gathered in this place. And so I ask now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might rise and meet you and that you will be pleased. May it be so in your many names. And in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. 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 It seems that a, a man died and went to heaven and he met St. Peter at the pearly gates. You've heard all this, right? And so St. Peter was showing him around and they went down the streets of gold and they passed all these huge estates and all these great mansions and it's just one after the other after the other and they get to the end of the road uh, to the, the bricks of gold and there's this little tiny shack. St. Peter says, this is your home. The guy said, wow, why is it that there are all these mansions and things and all I get is a shack? St. Peter said, well, I did the best with the amount of money you sent us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I only tell that story for one reason, and that is to remind you of what I've been saying to you all of this month. And that is, in the end, generosity is not about money. Amen? I hope that that has gotten infinitely clear. That money is simply a byproduct, along with lots of other things, of a generous heart, mind, body, and today, spirit. So in the end, generosity is not about money. Generosity of spirit. The way that our spirits join with the Spirit of God and the incredible impact that that can have in our own life and in the lives of others. You heard the contemporary reading this morning where we revisit a familiar phrase that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Now, you've heard that your whole life, right? And I don't know whether you've stopped to contemplate what in the world that means, but it seems to be an important part of understanding the spirit of generosity. And so, let's look at the metaphors that were offered to us in the contemporary reading. First of all, there was the metaphor of the watch. And pointing out to us that if you take the watch apart in all its little bitty pieces, it doesn't tell the same kind of time as it does when you assemble all of the parts and there is a whole watch. You see that? Mm -hmm. So each part certainly serves a great purpose and each part is essential and each part has its own place and its own space in the pieces of the watch. But until they're all put together, there is no whole. The contemporary reading also talked to us about the flower, where if you spread it apart, it will not produce. You can't nourish it and water it and get the same beautiful flower when you've pulled it all apart, even though every petal in and of itself is beautiful. One that wasn't in the reading, but is one of my favorites in terms of metaphors, is a jigsaw puzzle. Have you ever put together a jigsaw puzzle? And you were missing a piece or two at the end? Is that not just the worst? It's like you go and spend all that time trying to put all these pieces together, and then, and then you realize somewhere along the way you have lost some of the pieces. They're missing. Something has happened. They got broke. So, something has happened. Look at that. Look at this picture. There are four pieces missing. And despite all the other beauty that's there, where did your eye go? Right to the pieces that are missing. Do you see that every individual part matters, first of all? And second of all, when they're all put together, they make a beautiful picture. That is the whole. The whole that God invites us to all the time is to say that when we all participate generously, when we all give our mind, our heart, our body, and our spirit, 
then we have a complete picture. One that we don't see holes in. One that we are not drawn to the places that have spots. One where the beauty of the whole picture is clear and we see it. Well, it turns out that the scripture reading today is a very similar story about the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Now the story, as you were listening, I'm sure is familiar to most, if not all of you. The feeding of the 5,000. And where we see this miracle of there only being five loaves of bread and two fish, and miraculously 5,000 people were fed. We've heard this story, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Apparently, it's a very important story because it is only one of two miracle stories that is repeated in all four of the Gospels. That tells me there's something important about it. You know what the other miracle is? The resurrection. So this one's right up there, I'd say. So why is it that the writers of the books, the gospel books, felt that it was so important to include this? There must be something there. So I'm guessing that you've heard certain sermons about this where, you know, Jesus sort of creates a hocus-pocus miracle and suddenly there's enough food for everybody to eat. I want us to dive into this story a little bit more. I want us to look a little deeper at some of the implications of this story, especially if we know a little bit more about it. And so if we added all the details that we could gather up from the four different renditions in each of the Gospels, to the culture at the time, to the events that were surrounding this miracle, if we looked at all of those, what would the story sound like? feel like, look like, and how much more might this miracle mean? So I'll invite you into that story because I think it might have sounded a little like this. My name is Andrew. Most of my friends call me Andy. And this has been a really fascinating one. We've been with Jesus, all of us, and we've been going around to lots of these little villages where people were just dying to see Jesus. And we've been trying to help him and try to help with all the things he's teaching them and trying to help with all the ways that he's healing folks. And we're all pretty tired because it's just been constant. We just feel kind of slammed at the moment. And we just got word that our other friend who's not with us, John the Baptist, has just been killed, had his head cut off. And I watched when the word got to Jesus. When Jesus heard that his friend, the, the man that baptized him, had just been killed. Not, not just died, but had been killed in a horrible way. And I could just watch how it just went all over Jesus, the grief of hearing such a thing. And it was really interesting to watch that as tired as he'd been, he still just kept on. But when he heard about his friend, he just couldn't do it anymore. And so he said, you know, I just need to go and be by myself for a bit. And so Jesus got in a boat, and as he was often wont to do, and he went off to the sea. And the rest of us thought we would follow suit. We knew better than to follow him because he wanted to be alone. But we did, you know, go and find some places that we could be alone and we could rest because we were grieving too. Interestingly, interestingly, though, the word got out about John the Baptist. And the word got out that someone had spotted Jesus even though he was trying to be alone. And so all of those people in the surrounding villages begin to just sort of gather and find their way to the place where they heard Jesus might be. Jesus was still out on the water and he looked to the shore and he could see that people were gathering all around. And so even in the middle of his grief, even in the middle of being really, really exhausted, 
really in the middle of wanting to just be by himself, he saw the people gathering, and so he made his way in the boat back to the shore. He seems to have endless compassion for people, no matter what's going on with him. And so he gets out of the boat, and he begins to see how troubled people are, and how much healing they need, and how much they just want him to teach them. And so he makes his way to all the little groupings, you know, we understood later there were about 5,000 men there, which means there probably were more like 12,000 people when you counted the women and children. Lots of people. And they gathered so that he would just come and touch them and teach them and be with them. Just show up, because he's so good at that. And so he did that all day long, even while he was grieving himself. And then it started to get toward the end of the day when the sun would be going down soon. And, you know, some of us, we tried to tell Jesus, you know, we better send them back to the villages so they can get something to eat because the day is about to be done. And Jesus said, nope, you feed them. I just kind of wanted to go, seriously? There are 12,000 people here and you want us to feed them? Seriously? So some of us started to go out into the crowd. Now, seeing 12,000 people is not easy. Trying to get to them and see what have they got? What kind of food do we have here? We don't have enough money to go ourselves into the village and get some, but, you know, so we got to some, maybe 100 people that we could see and we found that one little boy was willing to give us five loaves of bread, barley bread, by the way, and two fish. Barley was the cheapest thing that anybody could use to make bread. So we certainly knew that probably the folks that had gathered there also didn't have much in the way of material things. They didn't have much in the way of money. But this little boy comes with his five loaves of bread and two fish. So we brought that to Jesus. It was almost like a joke. It's like, well, here's what we've got to feed him. You said feed him. Here we are. Jesus said to the crowd, I don't know how people heard him. It wasn't a loudspeaker or anything for 12,000 people, but he told them to sit down. And he told the rest of us, now go throughout the crowd and get them into groups of 50 or so. And just have them sit. And then what he did was just pretty amazing. He took those fish and bread, the loaves of bread, and he held them up as people were sitting in their groups of 50 all around. And what we saw starting to happen was that because it was the desert and people had left home to go out into the desert to see Jesus, they actually brought some food with them. And so they all started to pull out the food they had in their cloaks and in their baskets. And as Jesus held up the loaves and the fish, they started to hold theirs up too. And here was the miracle. When everyone gave what they had, there were 12 baskets left over. When everyone in all the little groupings of 50 pulled out what they had, there was enough. And so I would say to you, my friends, this is what generosity of spirit looks like. But more importantly, it is the miracle that generosity creates. Do you see it? <clears throat> Jesus, instead of seeing that there wasn't enough to go around, saw that there was something that God could use, that God could bless. So Jesus was able to see two things that the rest of us couldn't see. 
He said, there's something here that God can do with this mess. And that if we will all give what we have and combine it with what God can do, there will be more than enough. You see how that works? See, you and I would like, it would be so convenient, and most of us in, in our lives have chosen the convenience of interpreting this scripture. The convenience that Jesus just created a miracle and then there was suddenly enough. And that those people there had nothing to do with it. And it's easy for us to sit in our seats and say, we don't have anything to do with a miracle, but I think we would be misguided to believe that. Amen. Because just like the jigsaw puzzle, we all have a part. We all have something that we can generously give to make the whole picture work. And God blesses those parts and puts them together as a whole. And that's how we get more than enough. And so that is our challenge today. How do you and I step up and say, my part might not be as big as another's part. And Jesus would say, it really doesn't matter at all. Because when we put them all together, we will get more than enough. We might say, well, it's just not that big a deal. Somebody else will step up and do this thing, this little thing I can do. Jesus would say, no, we all, every one of us, all the puzzle pieces have to step up. Because that's what makes the whole picture. And when we have a whole picture, we have more than enough. The church, it seems, with Jesus as the head, is called to believe that there is a miracle when I give what I can and God brings the Spirit with my spirit and miracles happen. The church is called to believe this. And it is not about money. The church is called to believe that there will be enough of all of it if we give our part. That's it. Because a miracle awaits when we do that. This morning, in part because I didn't feel so good, in part because I know that generosity and talking about pledges and money makes people a little funky. <laughs> I, I just sort of stopped what I was doing in my office and decided I was just going to sit there and pray for a while. That was probably the best thing I could do. Not fret about it, just pray. So I was praying and I opened my eyes and I looked out the French doors of my office, and there's a little concrete patio there. And there was a hawk sitting maybe two feet from my door. And it just took my breath. I mean, there is this big hawk looking in at me. <laughs> and I remembered from my seminary days that in Scripture, the hawk is a representation when, when Scripture talks about the hawk is a representation of being able to see more than is visible. <laughs> right? <laughs> right, there it is. And so I was like, oh, oh, you're asking me, God, to take my own lesson and believe it. That I can fret all I want about how this day is going to go, but you can see things that are not visible, and I just need to trust that and get up and do my part. Amen. Do the part this church called me to do. That's all I can do. Yeah. And when all of you do your part, there will be what? More than enough. More than enough. And right after the hawk... It caused me to remember, seriously, only this morning remember, a story about something that happened to me in the church in St. Louis where Kate and I came from. Every winter for several months, we had a, a big building, and so we were able to open up our big lobby uh, to a citywide effort called Winter Outreach for homeless people to come two nights a week and stay the night and get out of the cold weather. And in that time, we could sleep about 30 people on cots, and we had blankets and nice sheets for them, and left them toiletries, we had a shower so they could get cleaned up, we gave them a meal, we played games with them and visited with them. 
By the way, Bella, my little dog, she was so great with them. <laughs> so our congregation would sign up to do things through the winter outreach months and each night when we opened our doors. And so uh, this was one night when I was supposed to be what we call one of the innkeepers, so I was staying overnight. And that, that day, during the day, it snowed like seven inches. Well, so there's two things about that. One is, we we're gonna have a lot of homeless people who needed a place to stay. And number two, we we're gonna have a whole lot of people who were supposed to show up and help not be able to get there. So it turns out, me and one other person, the only people who got there. Two people with 30 homeless folks and about 20 more standing outside the door begging us to let them in. Now, some of the people that didn't show up were the people who were supposed to help give out clothes that we had in our clothes closet. Some of the people that didn't show up were the folks who were bringing the food. Oh. Some of the folks that didn't show up were the other person supposed to stay overnight with me. So I was literally sitting there staring at the other person and thinking, what are we going to do? I mean, do we just need to close our doors? Because this is, it, it's not even good or safe or anything for us to try to do this. And so the other guy, Jimmy, who was there, he said, nope. Jimmy had been a homeless person himself at one time. He said, no, nope, Pastor, they need us, so we have to do this. I said, okay. <laughs> so, so we opened the door, and we let 30 people in, and they went to their cots and things. And so I called a huddle with all the group of us, all the homeless people who just come in. were freezing to death in the snow. And I said, so here's the deal. The people who were supposed to be here to help and to serve you, we're, you know, not all here, they're just two of us. So we're going to all have to work together tonight so that you have a safe and warm place to be. I said, now part of the problem is we don't have any food, so I'm sorry about that. We've got a few things to drink, but we just don't have any food. We'll open up our clothes closet. We can play games and have fun. All of those things are true. It'll be warm in here. But it's not going to be like it usually is for those of you who are regulars. So I trotted off out to the kitchen. Guess what I found in the kitchen? <laughs> Somebody had come early in the morning because they couldn't come in the afternoon for some other reason they had an appointment. And there was this big pot of chili plugged in uh -uh. to the outlet in the kitchen. So I'm like, yes. <laughs> so I grab the pot of chili and head on out, out to, the, you know, to the, uh, the lobby. But by the time I came back, you know what had happened? The food. table where the food was supposed to be? Mm -hmm. The homeless folks had dug around in their bags mm -hmm. and pulled out the food they were carrying around that they'd gotten from garbage cans and God knows where mm -hmm. and put it on the table. Mm -hmm. And that night, every one of us ate. Every one of us ate. You see how that works? God can see something that is not visible to us. And when we all do our part together, there is more than enough. It is something I deeply want this church to believe. That there is more than enough. We just have to do our part. We just have to do what we can do. And the beautiful whole will create something that not one thing in this whole world can stop. We cannot be stopped from helping people who have not yet come to this place or helping people who may never come to this place. We cannot be stopped. We cannot be stopped from standing up for those who don't have a voice there is enough. There's enough of us. There's enough money to give away. There's enough of everything we need. We just have to believe it. That's really what it comes down to. That God can see the things that aren't visible, and all I have to do is give what I have, and that only I uniquely have. 
I suppose that God also knows that the thing that is hardest for us is stepping up when it's about money. Right? I mean, that's what we're most afraid of, right? That's the hardest part. And so today, we come for the in-gathering. The in-gathering of the best that we have, which is just give what you have. We come to gather it in to make it the whole, where all of the parts come together and make a whole. That's what we're doing today in the end gathering. So most of you have had your pledge cards for a little bit. I hope you've had a chance to think about it and pray about it. I want to say this. If you left your pledge card at home today, <laughs> or you decided you weren't going to fill one out, but maybe now you've changed your mind, We've got some. <laughs> because everybody ought to be a part of the end gathering That's what I think. Because otherwise, our jigsaw puzzle is going to have some holes. I want to say again, it does not matter how big or small. I believe that totally. It doesn't matter. Because God can see things that are not visible to us in that gift. And I trust it, and I hope you will. So I want to invite Letitia and Kate to come up with me. They have served as our generosity team through this month, along with me. And I'm grateful for all the things that they have done to make this happen, things that you will never know about. You know why? Because they stepped up and they gave what they could, what they had. And so in a few minutes, we're going to start singing. And we're going to sing something we sang last week and that I told you a story about last week. Remember my South Africa story? When those little children sang to me, you are walking in the light of God. That Zulu African song, we're going to sing it. That you and me, we are walking in the light of God. And there will always be enough as long as we stay in that light. And so I want you to bring your pledge cards forward, and I want you to put them right here in the wheelbarrow. You're going to gather them up. And then as you leave, I want you to go by this way or that way, and Kate and Letitia have a basket full of leaves that have a word on them for you. We talked a few weeks ago about the cycle of giving and receiving, so I want you to come and give your pledge. And as you leave, I want you to receive a blessing that's right there on those leaves. Let's practice everything we've been talking about just in this one moment of end gathering. I want you to think about it deeply. The ushers have some pledge cards if you need them. Hey, don't be embarrassed. Just give what you have. Don't be embarrassed if you forgot or decided you weren't going to do it, but now you've decided you are. It's all good. It's okay. Just do your part. Do what you can. The rest will happen and it will be our own special miracle right here today. So let's start our singing.